Well, Eugene, Mm -hmm. from one war to the next, there's one last thing we wanted to talk about. um, And that is the continuing to develop situation in Niger, which is an issue we've covered a lot on the show. You and I, a little over a month ago, did an episode of Dispatches where you went into great detail about uh, the anti-colonial upsurge in West Africa. And for the last couple of months, Niger has been demanding that French troops withdraw from their country. So finally, finally, the French president has announced that indeed they will withdraw their troops from Niger. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of questions to be you know that I have for you about that. But first, what does that mean? What does that mean for French troops to actually withdraw from Niger? What does that mean for France's ability to extract uranium? among other things, but uranium seems to be one of the key components to France's, um, France's military presence in Niger. And it, like, does that mean its company will continue to extract uranium or will it not? Like, what does this mean in material terms? Mm-hmm. Well, I think there's a few elements to it. I mean, one, you know, we don't actually, the French ambassador who was refusing to leave has left. He's back in Paris as of today. Um, We don't know exactly when French troops will be leaving. They said in the coming months. Uh, It seems like there may still be some ongoing negotiations about what the modality of that will be. I mean, of course, there have been these huge protests outside the military base and these different issues. So I think they're figuring that all out. So when exactly it'll happen is yet to be seen. Um, Not that I think that it isn't going to happen, uh, but... There's at least some possibility, I think, that they might also be announcing this and hoping to maybe wait it out a little bit and see if there's a possibility Mm -hmm. the Nigerian government may fall or something like that. But that seems unlikely to me. Um, But we did see, you know, yesterday an announcement from Burkina Faso that there is an attempted coup uh, against the government there in Burkina Faso. So there may be some Mm -hmm. behind the scenes uh, cloak and dagger type machinations that this will withdraw within months is designed to cover. Um, But let's just assume it is going to happen. It's going to move forward and terms of the relationship, I mean, it's hard to say 100%. I mean, the issue of uranium uh, is obviously a big issue. I mean, I don't think that there is a, you know, imminent uh, threat to that being stopped necessarily because it is a major uh, industry there in in Niger and, you know, you don't necessarily find new customers overnight. But I, I say that just to say that there already was controversy between France and Niger over this issue. I mean, the largest uranium mine in Niger right now that is owned by Orano, the former Arriva, is in fact not operating. And it's not operating because there is a dispute between the former government or a former government of Niger and this French company. Uh, this actually dates back to several years over the percentage of royalties that would be uh, given to the 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 country. I, wanna, I think I have it written down here somewhere. Um, but, you know, basically, uh, well, I don't have the exact percentage. But anyway, long story short, uh, after they reached a quote unquote agreement over the uh over the the what the royalties were going to be on this mine the company then said well actually we're not going to operate the mine now they claimed that it was just uh because of market conditions after fukushima they couldn't sell you uh, uranium as much uranium they have one other mine in niger that they're operating but many people surmised at the time that they were trying to stop production in order to influence the government to potentially change the mining laws around royalties uh you know in a way that was more amenable to, uh, amenable to these countries so we'll have to see moving forward if similar types of tactics are used, but we'll also have to see if the Nigerian government in and of itself tries to do what Mali, for instance, has just done, which is raise the percentage uh, of income that will come to the country uh, from the exploitation of these minerals and whether or not that will then affect uh, the French mining operations there. Uh, You know, it's interesting to be seen. I mean, you know, about the 20 percent of France's uranium over the past five years comes from Niger. Uh, it's an interesting situation. I mean, Kazakhstan is first and Uzbekistan is third. So, I mean, that kind of puts all three of their major uranium suppliers in countries that are, you know, to some degree not fully reliable to the the NATO camp. So, you know, what space they have to maneuver is also another question there. There's other questions about the CFA, Frank, and others. But I think at the very least, it will mean that the ability of French power projection in Niger uh, and the ability to use military force will not be as ready of a possibility. They may send some people to Chad. Who knows what's going to happen? Allegedly, they were going to send troops to Benin, but now the government of Benin has come out and said that's not 
actually happening. That's not real. Um, so I think either way, the ability for France to project its imperial power in the Sahel and West Africa is going to be significantly hobbled by this. Well, let's get those violins out, Eugene. Um, <laughs> it's very, very sad for 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 France uh, for this this waning you know, former colonial power. Uh, but uh, I wanted to also ask you about another thing that many, many are curious about is the fact that Niger continues to be a host of the largest U.S. drone base in the world. Um, so far, we really haven't heard much, if anything, about that drone base from the new government in Niger. Uh, it really has. I mean, really, a lot of the protests have been focused solely on France for the most part, though it's been surrounded by a lot of like anti-imperialist and anti-colonial rhetoric. But many are wondering if the U.S. is next on the chopping block. Is there any signs that could be the case or have you seen, um, maybe I've missed it, have you seen uh, the issue of the U.S. drone base in Niger uh, becoming a talking point in any way uh, in Niger? <sighs> Uh, you know, to some degree, yes. I mean, it has not been the focus, certainly the government has not been the focus of mass protest. I mean, I think there's there's a lot behind that. But I think that, you know, quite frankly, France is the tip of the spear of neocolonialism in Niger and in West Africa. I mean, from the CFA franc that has, you know, in many ways controlled and destroyed these economies to the companies that are involved, to the French military presence. I mean, it's not as if America is not involved in Africa, but it's, you know, in many ways, the sort of Western neocolonial strategy in this part of the world is sort of led by France, not led by America, right? America's involved, but France is really in the forefront. These are their former colonies. And so there's an element of this that I think has that deep, long historical reality that for most people, the first step in self-determination and sovereignty for their country is to remove France. That actually is, you know, the symbol of the loss of sovereignty and the actual agency by which a lot of that uh, is, is carried out uh, to a much greater degree than really any other country in the presence of these places. And I think when you look at the role of the military and the CFA Frank, that is clear. That being said, I mean, a lot of the criticism in Niger, in Burkina Faso, in Mali, I mean, you certainly hear it from people, you know, on the ground, individuals and things who will raise these issues. But even in just the context of what people have been saying about the overall, you know, quote unquote, counterterrorism strategies of past governments that they are upset with is also an implicit critique of the United States, which, of course, is a partner with France in these various operations that have been going on and been happening. So I think at the very least, there is an implicit uh, uh, sort of statement involved in this that anyone who wants to remain involved in these countries is going to have to change and conform their behavior to something that is more amenable to the people people of these countries and what they would like to see. Now, what that is going to do for the U.S. is, is unclear. I mean, as of right now, at least allegedly a, well, there's two ways to look at it. There are two U.S. drone bases in Niger, one near the capital in Niamey and another in a place called Agadez, which is like out in the desert, which is the big one that a lot of people know about. They've basically, it seems, closed down the one in Niamey. They say, this is according to Stars and Stripes, uh, they are shifting personnel from there to Agadez, mm -hmm. and they're actually reducing overall personnel. So in and of itself, it seems that the U.S. is trying to reduce their footprint. And I think a lot of the reason for that is they are probably hoping not to draw the ire of people and probably assuming that there's kind of a domino effect aspect to this, that people are going to handle France. And then once they get that handled, they're going to move on to other concerns, which might include America. So maybe if they can get out of the way, uh, they will be able to maintain something, work out a modus vivendi with the government. The U.S. said that they were able to resume some operations from the Agadez base. Now, what they claim is that they were only surveillance-based operations. There's a lot of special forces and other people who operate out of that. So it seems that there is something happening behind the scenes with the Nigerian government in the U.S. over, and this is a big criticism, by the way, of France, of the United States right now. They're, you know, leaking like crazy out of the Alize Palace about how the U.S. is selling them out, you know? And so it's obvious that the U.S. is trying to maintain some presence and is basically willing to throw France overboard in order to do so. Um, we saw the same thing in Burkina Faso, by the way, uh, when Victoria Nuland went there shortly after uh, Ibrahim Traore became the leader and actually then was like, oh, everyone's so concerned about Russia. No, 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 it's fine. Um, they're not, you know, in their camp. Uh, and subsequently, I think they might have regretted saying that. But either way, um, you can see, you can certainly see it in the commentary from the Atlantic Council and from other think tanks. This is really the expert advice that the U.S. government is also getting. Throw France under the bus and hope somehow, some way, you can avoid 
people getting really pissed off at you, and then because there won't be as much mass anger, maybe you can work something out on the back end. Now, that hasn't really worked out for them um, in, well, they didn't try it all in Mali. They immediately threw, you know, Mali overboard and started to sanction them and isolate them. Burkina, it seems that they tried to work something out, but they haven't really worked out anything, at least along the lines of what, you know, I think they were hoping for when Newland went there. So now the question is, is what will happen with Niger? Um, you know, I, I don't know, quite frankly. I mean, I think, you know, Lloyd Austin is in Angola or was in Angola, I think, a couple of days ago. And he leveled some pretty serious criticisms of the government in Niger and Mali and Burkina Faso that sort of suggested that the U.S. is is looking on this very unfavorably. And so perhaps it seems more likely than not to me that they may not be able to find some sort of modus vivendi or agreement between each other um, that will allow the U.S. to continue to operate. But I do think that the whole U.S. strategy right now is to try to reduce their profile, stay a little bit to the side, let France take most of the hits, and hopefully in maybe kind of an out of sight, out of mind kind of way, maybe they can work something out with the Nigerian uh, government. But I think there's a lot of different variables that may make that difficult, especially just because the goals of the United United States in Africa uh, are so counterposed to the goals of Africans to rise up out of poverty and to have sovereignty in their own countries that I think it might make it difficult for a, a government that undoubtedly has many motivations. I can't speak to the motivations of all its leaders, but is really only in power because it's able to tap into mass anger and mass unrest with the multiple generations of poverty, deprivation, deprivation marginalization, uh, and domination that they've been subject to. So with that kind of base making it possible for you to be in power may be difficult, but it does seem obvious that the U.S. is kind of trying to go out of its way to maintain some presence uh, in Niger because for them, this is actually the central power projection platform in most of West Africa, perhaps even further. The Space Force is also there in Agadez, so it seems like it's also playing some role, perhaps, oh. with the overall satellite infrastructure. Perhaps it's playing some role with nuclear weapons targeting and different things like that. JSOC is basing out of there. They do many, many different things, the special forces all across Africa. So I think even beyond West Africa, there's a certain, and even well beyond Niger, a certain importance to that military presence they would like to maintain, um, even if it means a rift with their longtime uh, ally of France. But we shall see, and, and like I said, it doesn't seem to have worked out this sort of divide and conquer strategy uh, in some of the other countries where where it's been deployed. I mean, and also there is the question of what's happening behind the scenes in terms of pushing back against the these popularly supported coup governments. And you mentioned like a foiled coup attempt in Burkina Faso. Um, so I imagine there's like some schemes cooking one way or another. And that brings me to the issue of like, is it you know, Niger is also kind of under its own little blockade right now. Not little. I shouldn't say that. That kind of diminishes what it is. You have the ECOWAS countries that are essentially implementing this, like, blockade around Niger, an already extremely poor country where people don't have access to much. Um, and the impact of that, you know, we keep seeing in articles every week is it's it's just getting worse and worse for people who are already, like, on in a subsistence sort of situation. So how sustainable is that moving forward? Like, how sustainable is the situation for Niger because there's going to, I think, continue to be this attempt to choke the country into getting it to submit to at least some sort of like imperial um, demands. Yeah. No, I think it's a good point. I mean, you know, closing off the borders, making it difficult. I mean, we know the price of food is skyrocketing because it's hard for food to get in. Um, and on top of that, I mean, you know, you have maybe, I don't know, four and a half million Nigerians that uh, are totally reliant on food aid. And we've seen the World Food Program and others say that the closure of these borders is making it impossible for them to get in the aid that they need to get in to allow people to survive the rations that they've been surviving on. So that's creating a huge issue. The lack of electricity, um, which is very significant because it's been cut off um uh, uh, it's been cut off primarily by Nigeria, which is the main uh, provider of electricity and power to Niger. There's all sorts of things I've heard. I mean, you know, I even saw an advocate, an a very close ally of the president of Nigeria say that there were a large number of babies that were dying every day uh, in incubators because they did not have the proper electricity. Now, I, you know, I have not been able to fact check that, but, you know, it was reported in the Nigerian press and by a very close ally of the Nigerian 
government. Uh, so, you know, at least has that provenance, however you want to take it. So, you know, you're seeing the very typical shortages, all these different pieces. If you watch sort of state television in Niger, you see that there's a lot of conversation um, about things that the government and, you know, other people are doing to provide relief for certain individuals. But, you know, it's obviously very, very limited uh, in terms of, of what's possible, quite frankly, because it's a very, very poor country without a ton of resources and certainly without a lot of the critical development goods that are there. So the the goal seems to be to starve them out, but I haven't seen any scenes that that's actually working. And the protests and things like that that are supporting the you know so-called military junta that have been demanding France out, that have been you know talking about. I mean, you look at a group like M62, which is one of the major organizations that is behind these big protests that you see uh, in Niamey and other places. I mean, one of the things that they are well known for is protesting around issues of the cost of living and the challenges for working class people uh, and poor people in general. And so ultimately, if they're, you know, still coming out, still going strong, I think it's a sign that, you know, quite frankly, those who are the most concerned about those issues, which were pretty bad. I mean, you have, you know, 40 some odd percent of people living in poverty there uh, that, you know, even before this happened. Uh, the people who were upset about that even before this happened, even though the situation has gotten worse, you know, they're continuing to stand strong and continuing to say that a change has to be made. And I think recognizing that, quite frankly, to address the issues of poverty and, and inequality and underdevelopment over the long term, it will require some level of sacrifice because it will require breaking from very powerful countries that benefit, quite frankly, from the poverty of countries like Niger, uh, the enforced poverty in countries like Niger, and are thus standing strong. So I think the impact is very significant. I think the reality is, though, that people are very determined as well. So I don't know what the future is holding there. I mean, it certainly seems to me um, that, you know, the ECOWAS intervention here is really fizzling. Um, you know, you've just had the alliance of Sahelian states form between Burkina, Mali, and Niger. And one of the things that they're working on is pooling their resources economically as well as militarily. Um, the idea of an ECOWAS military intervention seems to basically have totally faded. Um, Nigeria, which was a big advocate of it, has now, you know, more or less reversed course and said that they're going to focus primarily on uh, diplomacy. There's no major power anywhere that's supporting it. Most of the other regional countries are, are against it, it seems, uh, except for a handful. And they aren't even for it in a really aggressive way, uh, as it were. So I think the sanctions policy, it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, this is kind of what happened with Mali, is they tried to throw in a bunch of sanctions right away, and they thought that they were going to fold. And when they didn't fold over time, they had to start rolling some of them back. Some of them are still on them, but they weren't able to retain it long term, partially because the people on the other side of the border in countries like Nigeria are losing a lot of money because they're not able to do their yeah. trade. So there's pressure coming from northern Nigeria on the central government there, for instance, um, to lift these sanctions because it's hurting them. So I think it's a, it's, it's a, a battle of wills, as it were, but you know we shall see.